So, in order to illustrate the point that I made yesterday, I would like to read to you a poem. And I would like you to listen to the poem and tell me uh, if you can guess who wrote it, okay? Just to help illustrate the point I made yesterday. Tell me what you think. I often go on bitter nights to Wotan's oak on the quiet glade with dark powers to weave a union. The runic letters the moon makes with its magic spell and all who are full of impotence during the, during the day are made small by the magic formula. They draw shining steel, but instead of going into combat, they solidify into stalagmates. So the false ones part from the real ones. I reach into a nest of words and then give the good and the just with my formula, blessings and prosperity. Who wrote that? You probably guessed it. Hitler wrote that. It's very interesting. That's a poem that... Uh, I think um, the reason why historians and Hollywood and so, so many are infatuated with Hitler is because of the mystery that he represents. Of course, the brutality and the shock captures people captures people's imagination. But the intrigue of what he, what he was uh, is, is the real question that captures people's mind. And anyway, I, I, I read to you this poem just to illustrate um, my point yesterday that uh, Hitler does indeed represent um, the, the rising of Wotan. However, there is something yesterday that I should have said but in a sense, I'm kind of glad I didn't say it. Um, this idea of Hitler as repressed uh, Odin, Wotan, is not my idea. It's not my original. It first was articulated by Carl Jung. And I'll probably provide some links under this video that you can go and read some very fascinating quotes um, that I think illustrate the point that I'm getting at. However, and this is a big difference. This is a, or sorry, this is a big distinguishing point, which I think um, going forward in terms of looking at history and looking at ourselves is going to, is going to be seen as a vital one. Uh, Carl Jung d was very helpful in uh, indeed, indeed I recognizing Hitler as a sort of mythological hero type of sort, it's particularly a medicine man, a mystical medicine man. In one quote, he said that Hitler's body does not actually suggest a lot of strength, but he's more like a, like in the sense of a warrior in a sense, but he's like a seer, a mythological seer. Um, that was Jung's perception of him based on pictures that he saw. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. However, and this goes to the point that I was making yesterday in yesterday's video. What does the Ger when Germans now look back, particularly Germans in Germany now, um, you know, globalists, uh, people involved in things like the Christian Socialist Party, Angela Merkel's party, etc. When these type of people look back at Hitler and the Nazis, what is their conclusion? Well, uh, it's actually implied already in the name of the party over there in Germany, which is Christian Socialist, right? What does that imply? It implies a, it's basically a, let's never be Nazis ever again, right? That's basically what it means. Um, it's, it's globalism, it's let's, let's never let this pop up ever again. Which is, as I'll uh, explain here, um, going to make sure by that very attitude that it does happen again in an unhealthy way in the same way that I mentioned yesterday that Nazism is an unhealthy way but I'd like to I'd like to uh, read to you a quote from the memoirs of uh, Dr. Alfred Rosenberg and his view sums up I think the view of a lot of people when they look back and they can actually see the Odinism the Wotanism that that was boiling up in the German soul he says and I quote 
Adolf Hitler, the fascinated disciple of Richard Wagner. And by the way, uh, it's an interesting thing that Niet, both Nietzsche and um, Hitler were huge fans of Richard Wagner. At least Nietzsche, Nietzsche was for a while until he had a falling out with Wagner. And then Nietzsche, you know, eventually uh, saw the uh, shallowness of Wagner, actually. Of this person who used to think was a great man. He actually had a falling out and had a change of opinions. And I think Nietzsche became wise in that point on Richard Wagner while um, um, Hitler, by contrast, did not. Anyway, to continue the quote, uh, Hitler, the fascinated disciple of Richard Wagner, listened in the Linz Theater. I had someone point out to me the pillar where Hitler used to stand. Now, like Wotan, he wanted to build a Val Valhalla. But when the will to power and right broke asunder, the castle fell to dust. What's he referring to there? He's referring to um, the collapse of the Third Reich. Hitler experienced Wotan's tragedy in his own person without being warned by it. And he buried Germany under the ruins of his Valhalla. And here's the point, the conclusion that Alfred Rosenberg makes. Yes, we must never disdain agreements, nor ever suffer a Loki to whisper ill counsel into our ears. What, in essence, he's saying we must never let this happen again. This, uh, this uh, rising of Wotan, of the spirit of Odin, we must never let this rise again. However, sorry, you can see how, how uh, tragic now, you can see how tragic of a viewpoint that is. And tragically, most people in Germany right now take that view, global, that's a globalist view, people take that view. And Jung even recognized, Jung talked about, and I'm getting to the distinction here, that where Nietzsche and Jung are very much at odds with each other, in the same way, that I articulate in an article that I wrote a long time ago that Nietzsche and Jordan Peterson are very much at odds. And uh, my main criticism of Peterson is that he's not, he doesn't acknowledge, uh, he's not honest enough about how much they diverge. And I just think he should be more um, upfront about how anti-Nietzschean Peterson is. But anyway, Young though does summarize very well, in, at least in some respects, uh, the German soul and what Christianity did to it. He says, Carl Jung says in 1918, Christianity split the German barbarian into an upper and a lower half and enabled him by repressing the dark side to domesticate the brighter half and fit it for civilization. You know, make Germans appropriate for civilization. But the lower, darker half still awaits redemption and a second spell of domestication. Until then, it will remain associated with the vestiges of the prehistoric age, with the collective unconscious, which is subject to a peculiar and ever-increasing activation. As the Christian view of the world loses its authority, the more menacingly will the blonde beast be heard prowling about in its underground prison, ready at any moment to burst out with devastating consequences. When this happens in the individual, it brings about a psychological revolution, but it can also take a social form. Now, here... Uh, here Young continues on this quote, and I'll get to it. He talks about the Jews. And I, I'm going to read his quote, and then I'm going to elaborate on the Jews. Because I think this is really important. In my opinion, this problem does not exist for the Jews. The Jew already had the culture of the ancient world, and on top of that, 
has taken over the culture of the nations amongst whom, whomever he dwells. He has two cultures, paradoxical as that may sound. He is domesticated to a higher degree than we are, but he is badly at a loss for the quality in man which roots him to the earth and draws new strength from below. This thonic, chthonic quality is found in dangerous concentration in the Germanic peoples. The Jew has too little of this quality. Where, where has he his own earth underfoot? That's really funny. Um, one of my favorite songs is, uh, and my partner's songs, favorite songs is uh, a song by Mumford and Sons, which actually kind of in paradoxically gets to that point. It's called "Below the Fe Below My Feet," "Keep the Earth Below My Feet." Young stated in another time as well that we new Germans need some new foundations. We must dig down to the primitive in us. For only out of the conflict between civilized man and the Germanic barbarian will there come what we need, a new experience of God. Interesting. So, the reason I bring this up is because, uh, is because Young and Nietzsche saw a similar thing, but they had different um, solutions, or they, they looked at it differently, very differently. So Jung saw, oh, we, the Germans have this problem of this repressed barbarian, right? And for Jung, it was like, we need to do something about this. We need to have a new experience of God in order to, uh, to re-domesticate this darker, you know, lower repressed barbarian. And it's so funny because, uh, um, it, Jung was heavily influenced by Nietzsche. But at the end of the day, Jung really turned his back on Nietzsche in that regard. Because Nietzsche's conclusion was the opposite, which was that we Germans will pay dearly for having been Christians for 2,000 years. And Nietzsche even said at another point, and I might attach the, the quote, but anyway, I'll, I'll butcher the quote, but the, he said to the effect of, uh, Germans have a chance here to become truly a non-Christian nation, truly a non-Christian nation, to go back to what they were. But what, what I think is my unique contribution to this uh, historical study, and I think it is a vital one, and I think Germans need to take it to heart, and I think humans need to take it to heart, because really we all are uh, affected by this problem to some degree or another. When people look back in time, and I remember, too, uh, I, a lot of the Anglo-Saxons in North America or whatever, when they looked over at what was happening in Germany with Hitler, they thought to themselves, oh, my God, uh, the Germans are abandoning Christianity and going back to Wotan. And in a sense, they were kind of right. But the problem is, is that they were only kind of right. And, and that's the real problem here with Jung, is that he's only kind of right. And Nietzsche gets more to the heart of the matter, which is, which is the, what I said in the video yesterday. What ultimately caused the Holocaust? What actually caused it? What caused it was not the rising of Odin and Wotan. That's not what caused it. So people, people think, oh, Wotan rose again, so there, and therefore he, therefore he caused the Holocaust. It's like, it's like no, no, no. Nietzsche saw what the German soul was working towards ultimately, but it's that the German soul was unsuccessful in it, unsuccessful in it that caused the Holocaust, that left the Germans themselves resentful, of needing to scapegoat in the most absurd way. Because of course it's 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 stupid beyond belief to to uh, be anti-Semitic and not be anti-Christian. Like it's just it's just unbelievably absurd, uh, and it's amazing the gymnastics you can you see when people when they when they try to do that and when you know when they try to when you try to be a Christian anti-Semite when you try to it's like it's like you're you hate the very thing of which you yourself are the product. But for Jung, it was a question of, we've got to find a new way to experience God. For Nietzsche, it was a question of, 
uh, for Nietzsche, or sorry, for Young, it was more of an issue of uh, we must beware of this barbarian. And like that other quote by that Alfred guy, he he's like, beware of the barbarian underneath. Beware of the barbarian underneath. And Nietzsche just flips it. And he says, no, 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 no. For the German soul, beware of the aggravants that turn that blonde beast into something really nasty, that turn it into something nasty. It's like, it's like you know, the Vikings of old, um, the Viking spirit. You know, and there's a lot of like metal bands that su- try are trying to emulate that Viking spirit, getting, getting away from the Christian ethos of love your neighbor, but go back to the Viking spirit. And um, uh, what's a good band? Uh, Amon Amarth, if I said that right. They're a good example of a metal band trying to get back to that Viking spirit. But what, were the Vikings, the Vikings were dangerous, no doubt. And we, in our day, we would call them terrorists. You know, they'd come through and, and pillage and rape and kill. And, but the thing with the, with the Vikings is that that's, this is a funda, fundamental mis, uh, misunderstanding of the barbarian. It's a fundamental misunderstanding. The barbarian is a barbarian in a sense, but the barbarian in the sense, he's a barbarian in the sense that he um, doesn't repress his his rage, his anger, of which we all experience, well, of which we all inevitably experience, even in a healthy way, we experience that. We should all experience it to some degree, because the world can be totally confusing and extremely frustrating all the time. Like it's it's just the barbarian gave expression to that anger, and so they would they would go and do their exploits, and then they would just you know chill out for a while. It's like C.S. Lewis said, um, at least with the robber baron, at least with the, at least with the robber baron, if you live under a robber baron, you can be confident that at some point his, uh, his extreme uh, rapaciousness will be satiated at some point. He'll be satisfied at some point, at least for a while before he starts doing his being a robber baron again. But C.S. Lewis said, those who torment us for our own good, you know, those who, like socialists, communists, those who torment us for our own good will, will do so at, without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. And what he, what he means is, is uh, the, uh, what was more noble about the Odin spirit, the Viking spirit, you know, a lot of the indigenous spirits, is when they did take over, they didn't ha- wear a pretense of caring about people. And the Nazis shared that as well. However much I'm not a Nazi, I can recognize, and I don't, you know, I have to be careful to say this, I'm not promoting Nazism. But the one thing that is admirable about it is, is, is it's more relative honesty. Like it would tell you up front that it doesn't like the Jews or it doesn't like blah, 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 you know, or that it's going to conquer, you know. While socialism and communism is much more nefarious, because it wants to conquer also, it wants to dominate also, but under the guise of caring about you, which it obviously does not. Anyone who can see, what did Nietzsche say? Um, one is, has observed life poorly if one does not see the hand that very kindly, in a kindly way, kills. And that's so true, that's really to me sums up socialism and communism and modern globalism and so really what's going on people people think we're being nice and christian when you know the germans you know turn their back on odinism and uh embrace socialism or whatever but they're really just of course exchanging one tyranny for another but the point going back of what i was saying is that is that although it is true the barbarians and the all sorts of barbarians could be very barbaric, at bottom they weren't really that. It's a mistake to view them as that. They were so much more than that. It was always a mix of ver- to varying degrees depending on the tribe, depending on, you know, so for, for the Germanic Goths, it would be one thing, for the Vikings another, for the, you know, Mongolians, whatever. It was always a, uh, there was always some culture in, 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 in these different barbar- barbarians, right? Of course, they eventually get to some extremes or some c- cultures would be so barbaric that they would eventually, you know, start, you know, sacrificing their own kids and stuff. Anyway, that like the Aztecs or the Incas, they would eventually be ripe for their own destruction. They'd be basically calling for their own destruction. So there was like a, 
nature did kind of find a balance in terms of barbarianism. It did find a balance. Like when you went too far, eventually that group over there will come and just wipe you out. And uh, the Old Testament actually talks about that. When it talks about the Canaanites or the Amalekites or whatever, they were, the Canaanites in particular were a vicious, vicious barbarian people. And it says in there, in the Old Testament, to the, to the prophet, like uh, the, warrior, uh, the warrior prophets of the Old Testament, they, it was said that they heard from God, that God basically said, well, I'm going to allow them to get this bad. And then once they're uh, past that bad, then, then uh, you know, I'm going to give you the chosen, chosen people, the Jewish people, at the, which at that time was a warrior race as opposed to now, which they are not. Um, the order to go and just wipe them all out, man, women, men, women, and children, just wipe them out because they were so barbaric. So I'm not saying that there was no extreme barbarianism, but the general principle is that barbarism was on a scale. And, uh, and we, in our Christian moralizing, are so afraid of it that we cannot see that within, ver the, within along the scale of barbarism, there was, that went, there was something that with, went, went with it, and that is psychic vitality. There was a psychic vitality in, the, in, in many of the ancient barbarian cultures that is like, totally lacking in modern modernity, in our comfort in our comfortable culture, our love your neighbor, or at least, you know, pretend to, to go along, to get along culture, right? And I think the Germans in particular could feel this. They were missing out on a vitality. And when Hitler appeared, he struck a chord in a way that hadn't happened since like Napoleon or Muhammad or whatever. It wasn't so much about the warrior ethos as much as it was about the psychic vitality that that represented. Um, in contrast with, in some people's view, there was one historian who described Christ as uh, the pale Nazarene. The pale Nazarene has conquered. And that's a really interesting point too. It's something I have noticed. In, tw in 2018, I went to Italy. I went to Ortona, Italy, near Pescara. The reason I went there is because that's where, that's the location that my own grandfather, a Canadian, fought the Nazis and lost his leg. I went to the very place where he lost his leg. And I stayed at a bed and breakfast there and it was, it was amazing. Um, like, I have no ill will towards the Canadians or the Germans. It's just, this story is just fucking amazing. Um, I stayed at a bed and breakfast there, and, you know, I'd look out the window, and there was just a, it was just a little alleyway, and I'd look at the building across the way, and uh, there were still bullet holes in the, in the, in the, in the walls from the street-to-street street, uh, fighting that happened between the Canadians and the Nazis. And as much, like, I honor my grandfather's, both grandfather's contribution to, uh, to the war. God bless them both. I honor them both. But there is something that I've noticed. And that is that, uh, what was it called? The Luftwaffe in the German army and uh, in the Third Reich and other... Uh, The Germans were respected for their ferocity. Aside from the fact that there was a time in Ortona at Christmas where uh, some Germans and some Canadians actually got together and they really liked each other. And they're like, you know, why the hell are we fighting? It's just stupid. And I think that a similar thing happened in World War I. The British actually fundamentally liked the Germans and vice versa, which is an interesting thing. But one thing that the Canadians couldn't deny is the, the fierceness, the ferocity of, of the Germans and how disciplined they were. And I was also talking with my partner about this. I was like, you know, say what you will about the Nazis. And I'm, again, I don't, I'm not a Nazi. I don't support Nazism. I'm not saying this. The question is much deeper than this. Say what you will about the Nazis. They were, re they were dressed really well. They were really well dressed. 
and I say all these things, the, the, the discipline, the ferocity, the fighting, uh, the really well-dressed, it, it, to me that is, an, they, they got a boost from the psychic vitality of the old barbarism or of the old Wotan, the old, they got a boost from that, a psychological boost from that that their uh, love your neighbor, Martin Luther, Christianity uh, did not provide. In contrast with the Canadians, when I look at a lot of the pictures of the Canadians who fought, I mean, obviously, like I said, I honor. Um, but often I feel like um, when I put the Canadians or some of the Americans, you know, side by side, maybe particularly the Canadians, but some of them seem just really pale and gaunt in comparison to the German fighters. Now this may be an, it's probably an overly simplistic viewpoint. But I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of Canadians, I think a lot of Americans, a lot of Westerners in general, um, I think it's a mistake to conclude, this is kind of a segue, I guess, or kind of a distraction, I mean, but it's a mistake to conclude that people who, um, the peop the Westerners who fought against the Nazis were doing that solely for, uh, for freedom, you know, fighting for our freedom, right? Sure. But I think we're being dishonest when we don't acknowledge that a lot of Westerners were eager to fight in the war, eager to fight this dragon that we named Hitler, this strange beast that emerged from out of the German soul. Say whatever you will about him. It's become apparent to me that, and I think if you look back, you'll find a lot of people, a lot of uh, Western soldiers who were eager to fight. They were eager to be warriors, and they were eager to have a warrior enemy, and they found that in the Germans. And to this day, for, for those veterans who are still alive from that war, uh, many of them and this is, I'm not saying this critically, I'm not saying this is bad. Uh, it's just, I think, the honest truth. Many people define themselves by the wars they have fought. And so in that sense, Hitler, paradoxically, incidentally, gave a lot of Westerners um, their sense of identity and meaning and mission. And without him, they would not have that. And I think that's part of the reason why we are so adrift in this, in our day and age. Our war is definitely more of a spiritual war in our day and age, particularly for Generation X, particularly, which is another video I can make another time. But in general, our war is more of a, more of a spiritual war. But with, I think we don't acknowledge how, how much, uh, at least to a degree. Now, of course, when they got to battle, they're like, what am I doing here? They wouldn't want to be there. You know, it's just horrific, you know the trench warfare, you know, seeing your buddy's heads, head blown off or limbs blown off and just, just horrific. And they need to have PSD forever, blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't change the fact that originally when, when they went out to war, a lot of them were excited for it. And I think it's important to be honest about that. So in a sense, the vitality of the barbarism of the old gods, the psychic vitality that often went along with that actually spilled over also into even the Western fighters who are fighting against them. But getting back to my main point, forgive me, I digress. With, with the Nazis, uh, with the Nazis, Nietzsche, Nietzsche would have seen that as an inevitability, but he would have disagreed sharply with Carl Jung and now Jordan Peterson. He would have dis disagreed sharply with them and considered their position disastrously wrong to think that this is just an old uh, Odin, Wotan, lying dormant. That it's just that, and it's just been rising again because Christianity has been down on the decline. Now, there's truth in that. 
but Nietzsche's point was much more nuanced and much more to the point, which is that 2,000 years of love your neighbor Christianity without the psychic vitality of, of war and being a warrior, which is ultimately, I'm getting at, the German soul probably longs for more than other races. Although I think most races do, except for mm, the Jews, which Nietzsche said had, had a more uh, completely firm foundation in its contempt for man, which is an interesting thing. So that's a whole other interesting question. Well, what is a Jew, right? Psychologically, psychophysiologically, what is a Jew? And the, Ger the Germans, like if you examine psychologically what is a Jew, you'll, you'll eventually come to the conclusion, and after looking at the Germans, that you'll be like, okay, yeah, the Germans are definitely not what a Jew is. But the tragedy is that, in Nietzsche's view, I think, the tragedy is that the Germans also held on to Christianity, which is a product of Judaism. And I think if Hitler was alive, or sorry, I think if Nietzsche was alive when Hitler was alive, he would, he would criticize Hitler not for being Hitler, but for being inconsistent. That he would, uh, he would say Hitler, you know, uh, was anti-Semitic. He wouldn't, I don't think he would criticize uh, Hitler for being anti-Semitic. He would criticize Hitler for being a hypocrite, for being anti-Semitic, but not being anti-Christian, which is the product of Semitism, of Judaism. And, and it is that antagonism, that codependence, that uh, the German soul held on to, that, that it couldn't let go of, which I think in Nietzsche's view, if he saw the Holocaust and, 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 and could have looked back on it, he would have seen that codependence as the cause of the envy and the scapegoating, which caused the particular vicious and systematic nature of the Holocaust. When a normal warrior Viking race or whatever, like an Odin race or whatever, wouldn't do something so vicious, so systematic, and so uh, it wouldn't normally do that. And so my, you can hear my point, which is that for Carl Jung, uh, he could not see how the light side, the good side, you know, the good and the just, he couldn't see how that was actually feeding the beast and turning the beast underneath the long thousand year repressed beast into something particularly viciously nasty that would not have attained that level of viciousness and nastiness if not for that terrible war inside the Germans, the codependence, the inability to get rid of the Christian ethos, which is indeed a child of the Jewish ethos. Again, just to be clear, I'm actually not in this video being critical of Christianity. Like I mentioned, I think, uh, for Anglo-Saxons in particular, Christianity has been a lot more appropriate, although still problematic. It's very complicated. But for the Germans, it's a different story. It's much, much worse. And it is not, it is not either Christianity, like I said before, or Odinism that created the Holocaust. It's the tension between the two that created in the German soul a very pathological, unhealthy, resentful anti-Semitism, desperate to scapegoat. So it looked to, to scapegoat to the Jew while it could not see the Jew in itself, that is, its Christianity. And Nietzsche was much more honest, and that's why he wrote the book The Antichrist. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a treatise against the, you know, trying to say that the theology of, or, the, you know, the miracles of the Bible was bullshit. He didn't care about that. It was about values. And that's what the Antichrist is about. And tragically, it seems to me now that the Holocaust happened precisely because the German soul could not let go of its codependency. And that's why the Holocaust happened, and it would not have happened without, without it. Now, regardless of whether people argue whether it was actually 6 million or 2 million, but, you know, from my perspective, when one considers this, this argument, one realizes, you know, it doesn't fucking matter. Whether it was two people or two million or 20 million, it doesn't matter. The principle is still the same. From this perspective.
that the German soul needs to come to terms with not just what it is from an Odin Wotan perspective. It doesn't just need, it's this huge mistake to just condemn the Odin part that w rose up without, without reconsidering the good part, which ultimately was a massive aggravant that created, that helped create the Holocaust. Anyway, I hope I've made sense in this video. But uh, I was pretty excited last night when that distinction occurred to me between Carl Jung and Nietzsche. And my, my encouragement to people would be to follow Nietzsche's line of thinking. That in that sense, Carl, Carl Jung's assessment, although he's right to assess the German soul, or assess Hitler as a Wotan, his uh, conclusion about what caused the excesses of the expression of Wotan is, in my view, catastrophically wrong. Thanks.